have two lectures one as a guest faculty by dr tejas who is a consultant anesthetist at dr grace hospital nhs elgin scotland he yeah, then is a fellow in uh, from royal college of uh, anesthetists as well as uh, as a <laughs> diploma in european european diploma in regional anesthesia and he previously worked as at the uh, san jose hospital as well as uh, he is a gold medalist in the md examination of rdhs in 2005 he is an acl is instructor at san jose and he has been a quiz master for uh, various conferences and pg excel and he has many publications to his credit so i welcome dr tejas and he will be talking on analgesia of the knee surgery i welcome dr tejas to give us presentation please welcome dr tejas thank you <clears throat> shall i start sharing now yes yeah yeah please go ahead with the presentation Right. Right. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to present on this platform. Uh, the topic I am going to be speaking on today is analgesia for knee arthroplasty. Before going to the main part of the topic, let us put it in context. And knee arthroplasty is one of the very common surgeries that we are all doing these days. and world over the incidence of people needing knee arthroplasty knee replacement surgery is is, is going on increasing um, and what all that does is it creates a lot of pressure on us to provide uh, value value for the patient who is paying or the government or the insurance company value for the hospitals and that again leads on to demand for more volume of work and at the same time we don't want to compromise on quality we want good quality of care to our patients a brief look at what all is happening if you look at numbers like i said as of now even at 2020 it was already well over 1 and 1/2 million operations per year and this is us data data would be similar elsewhere in in uk where i work we have waiting lists for uh, knee joint operations running into the hundreds people wait for one two years sometimes more than two years to get their operation done the immense pressure for us to try and get this done more and more as 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 quickly as we possibly can of course covid has not helped any of that um and in all this context what happens is you are hearing more and more about shortening the duration of stay quicker operations enhanced recovery day care arthroplasty and that is the buzzword and and when you start looking at things even if you start looking at medical conferences and things these are things that you come up if you look at medical twitter so this is about 20 hours after right knee replacement a block and no walker very little pain taking tylenol yeah and so a patient in 20 hours after uh, knee replacement surgery is walking so well and and, and this is boldly advertised and it makes you think i mean where are we what what is what the kind of work that we are doing and if you look at uh, it from a layman point of view and you look at advertisements you go to hospital sites this is what you come up with painless quick recovery advanced surgery safe and affordable um, and and so on so forth if you look at another advertisement here i mean another hospital site walk within hours of surgery discharge within 3 to 4 days walk without support in 2 weeks even news websites non hospital websites for general information to people if you look at it you will be able to walk same day after surgery so that is the public expectation that is the pressure on us to provide a service which will enable this but that's not the full story now this was published in 2017 in uh, in the us and one thing to note here is the huge number of joint replacements that during anywhere between 7 to 10% of the population is going to need joint replacement is what they say but of interest is this bottom right corner 80% of the patients do not have regional anesthesia techniques for their tks of course this is uh, retrospective data from 2017 and i hope things have changed a bit but yet we are not quite there yet where everybody gets the most optimal care and analgesia but the problem even this is not the full picture the thing is knee arthroplasty is very very complex 
from many different points of view you you may, we mainly talk about three things it's patient factors uh, <coughs> surgeon and anesthetist uh, in terms of patient factors uh, the elderly population multiple comorbidities uh, pain for a long duration of time um, un unlike a gallbladder or a hernia operation joint uh, arthritis is not a single joint problem usually it's a systemic problem which means the pain, they will have pain in the other hip, the other knee, pain elsewhere. So many things have been going on. And, and putting all that into context, it's not easy to say that we will make you walk on the same day and everything will be absolutely fine just because we put local anesthetic around one joint. Dig a little deeper and, and you find out even more. Uh, choosing the right candidates for knee replacement is not easy. It says about a third of patients who underwent knee replacement achieved very little benefit from their surgery. So on, on the one hand, you want knees which are really worn out or reasonably worn out. And you want people to have tried all other different options and, and arrive to surgery at an optimum state where they will get the best out of surgery. But in terms of date stay surgery for arthroplasty, you want to choose patients who are relatively healthier, relatively less complex joints, which you can turn over quickly and, and get, get them pain-free sooner. So it, it, getting that balance is not easy. All right, now let's move on to the analgesia component itself. Uh, we are all familiar with the concept of multimodal analgesia. For the purpose of today's talk, however, I will not focus on how to anesthetize for knee surgery or go into details of all of these things. Well, each hospital has their own guideline or protocol, and we try to streamline things by doing the same thing over and over repeatedly. We hope we can get higher volume of work and get better at it. Um, so today, what I'll focus is on the regional anesthetic techniques that are available to us. And specifically, we will look at the plenty of different regional options that are available from neuraxis to close to the joint. So we will try and look at those options which have motor sparing effect, which hopefully will enable us to mobilize our patients same day or at least as quickly as possible. So when we talk about motor sparing blocks, the first thing that you will probably think of is an adductor canal block. So what exactly is an adductor canal block? We have been doing femoral blocks and sciatic blocks for knee replacements for many years now. Initially, when people started doing it, people were doing putting in epidural catheters. Uh, people, some people may have tried lumbar plexus blocks, and then we came down to femoral nerve blocks. Um, and that was a mainstay for a number of years. But what was often found is that the incidence of falls and the problem with paralysis of the quadriceps muscle for up to 24 hours after a femoral nerve block limits when you can mobilize them. So if you want to get the patient up with physiotherapy and moving on the same evening or within 24 hours, they want us to avoid doing a motor blocking femoral nerve block. And if you put a sciatic nerve block, it's even worse because sciatic nerve block takes much longer to wear off. So you will have eventually a patient whose femoral nerve block wears off, the sciatic is still not worn off, so they can't walk, but they're still in pain. So that, that went away a long time ago. So what we are trying to do is still try to block those fibers of the femoral nerve, which are going to supply most of the knee, but spare the muscles above it. So let's look at anatomy. Sorry, my slide is frozen. There you go. Right. So when we say adductor canal, this is the space which is underneath the sartorius. In this picture, the sartorius has been taken away. We are familiar with the femoral nerve, which comes lateral to the femoral artery and soon divides into a number of different branches, which supply the muscles of the anterior thigh. But we are more interested in these nerves, which is the nerve to vastus medialis, and then the saphenous nerve, which is the continuation of the femoral nerve, which will be traveling underneath the sartorius. And these are the ones which we are going to target. Where exactly in should we be doing them? There have been different things described in literature. So people started doing it somewhere down here and then maybe higher up in the adductor canal. And then some people said, why not we go up to the femoral triangle and block it up here? So let's look at some of the advantages, disadvantages. So femoral triangle 
it is bounded by we, we know the anatomy of the femoral triangle but the femoral nerve will be coming from somewhere here and sort of exits the femoral triangle somewhere at this point and then goes under the sartorius so when we say femoral lab blocking at the left Level of the femoral triangle. What we want to do is yes, identify. Yeah, I'm not getting the. You're not getting the image. Or... Yeah. Sorry, you're you're not getting what? Now the, the image, the display was not there. Now it is come. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't realize. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah. Thanks for letting me know. I mean, sometimes if something like that happens, just uh, interrupt me because I right. can see it on my screen. Um, I... So yeah, what I was saying was when we say blocking at the level of femoral triangle. What we fix an ultrasound where the sartorius is crossing the lateral border of the adduct, uh, medial border of the adductor longus and try and block it above that, but not where the femoral nerve has not yet gone under the sartorius. Because if you go higher than this, then the spread will be more proximal and you will get motor blockade. And this is where people are trying to put in the block. The second option is to go just beyond the apex of the femoral triangle. And try to block it, and I will yes. come into a bit more yes. detail. Yes, yes, sir. Sorry, sorry. One second. Probably the cursor should be away from the screen. When the cursor is, yeah, I now we are able to see the image. Now it's out. Oh, it's out. It's not there. It's not there now. Now it's come. Okay. Now it's not there. So if I bring the cursor here, is the image disappearing? Now it's it's not there. So the image is not there. Image is now it is there, now gone. Now it is there. I think you push the um, cursors away from the screen. Yeah, it's away. I think you I was trying to use the cursor as a pointer, but uh, I'll, I'll keep it away. Is, but is but it now? Let's see. No, now no, there is no image seen by us. Oh. Uh, some I some uh, just a small technical thing. Mm. Um. No, 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 we are not able to, all of us are not able to see. Oh. It's on and off, on and off. In the sense, image would come and then disappear, comes and disappears. Mm -hmm. What should I do? I don't know. I don't know why it is happening. How can I sort it? Oh, it's coming, <laughs> Tejas. It's displayed. Now, it, mm. now displays on. Okay, the image has not changed a lot. I, if you have got the image once, I hope... Uh, I can uh, kind of catch on to that and uh, speak on the basis of that. Image is uh, there. Try and move on. Image is there. Go on. Yeah, I'll try and move on. So, one is to block it where it has just gone under the sartorius. Two is the mid part, uh, is at, around the apex of the femoral triangle. And the last part where you could, some people have tried blocking it is distally in the adductor canal. Now, if you go too proximal and put a higher volume, there is now barrier for it to spread up and down, which means it can potentially give you a motor block. If you go too low, then you will probably miss the nerve to vastus medialis. And I will tell you a bit more in detail with the next picture. But if you go lower down, some th the one part of the theory is that the local anesthetic will go through the adductor hiatus and reach the posterior compartment and give you some analgesia on the posterior aspect of the knee. So the, and, and different concepts and talks have been done when we say femoral triangle, adductor canal, and then the posterior part. So these are the three aspects we are looking at. So is it a tunnel? Is it a canal? Or is it a funnel? Is, is, is a very interesting way it has been posed as. So let me try and give you some detail about the nerve to vastus medialis. If you look at this picture, on this picture to the left of my screen, so can, if you can see my cursor, is uh, the lateral aspect. So you see the RFM is rectus femoris muscle. VMN is uh, vastus medialis nerve. And uh, SAN is the saphenous nerve. So what you can see is when, when we try to do the adductor canal block, we try to bring the needle from lateral to the medial side in plane. If you go more cephalad or higher up, these two nerves are relatively close to each other and you are likely to get both of them. However, the nerve to vastus medialis is in a separate facial compartment. There's a fascia separating those two. If you don't see the nerve to vastus medialis, there is a danger that you might actually put your needle through it or damage the nerve. So that is one potential pitfall. But if you go further down, you're more likely to miss the nerve to vastus medialis and only get the saphenous nerve, which 
probably will lead to a situation where the analgesia will be suboptimal. So this is the ultrasound image, which many of us may be familiar with. You see the muscle at the top, and then you see the pulsating artery, and you often see the saphenous nerve as a white glistening structure. And that's what we try to aim our needle for. The nerve to vastus medialis is somewhere a bit more lateral to that, and your needle is going to come in through this. So I've got a little video, if I can get that to play. And before I go to the video, this is what I cautioned about, that if we damage the nerve, to the nerve to vastus medialis, later on you can have atrophy of the vastus medialis muscle, leading to partial weakness and damage. So this should open in a different window. I hope it will play. Sorry, it is playing up. Let me try one more time. Yeah. Okay. In this video, you can see the needle coming in from lateral. And as we begin to inject the local, it really begins to brighten up the nerve to vastus medialis with the contrast of the local in the background. Then we advance and click through the vasoadductor membrane. And now you can see the two nerves separately. Yeah. In this video, you can see That's the needle. It. So it's going to cycle. So it's just a few seconds video. What I was trying to demonstrate was the needle coming in from lateral. And as you start injecting from the lateral aspect, once you enter under the sartorius, if you start injecting your local anesthetic, it gives you a better chance of identifying that nerve to vastus medialis and then get the needle to come more medially next to the femoral artery to get the saphenous. Okay, next we'll talk about the IPAC. So IPAC stands for infiltration between the popliteal artery and the capsule of the knee. So what is done is a curvilinear probe is used. Often that is required to be able to see the depth in this region in patient in a lateral or a frog leg position. Uh, so probe is pos placed posteriorly and this is the image you're likely to see, right? And I have a little video for this as well. So essentially what we're trying to do is bring the <clears throat> needle between the space between the popliteal artery and the femoral capsule and deposit 20 mils of local anesthetic in that region, trying to get the branches of the sciatic nerve, which are going to be traveling in this space to reach the knee joint from behind. So I'll go down and see the condyles of the femur and then slide back up until I see the flat line of the metaphysis. I'll bring the needle in from lateral, although you can do this supine in a frog leg position too, and come in from medial. We'll go all the way across, and then as we pull the needle back, we'll deposit our local. And you can see the artery lifting up as they fill up that space and block those fine little nerves of the popliteal plexio. So I'll go down and see the condyles of the femur and then slide. Okay. I hope that video was visible. Next, uh, we'll speak about the genicular nerves. So if you look at the innervation of the knee, there is a, a lot of plexus of nerves right around the knee. And some of these nerves are coming in from the sciatic and they travel very close to the periosteum, eventually supplying the capsule of the knee. So these are very small nerves. They're very difficult to identify in the ultrasound. But what we can easily see is the bone and the periosteum. So all we have to do is put some local anesthetic just next to the periosteum in four different areas or three different areas with the fourth one, I'll tell you about why we don't. Uh, so you go for the superolateral, superomedial and inferomedial, identify the bone, put some local anesthetic to, to lift off just above the periosteum. Inferolateral is a bit controversial. There are, I know some people who, try to put local you were there as well but what you are likely to get is a bit of foot drop if you get the common peroneal nerve and that potentially will prevent your patient from walking so to avoid that most people would avoid doing the inferolateral genicular nerve 
again i've got a different picture which gives you a bit of an idea of how it's likely to look uh, you can either go in plane or you can go out of plane you're not targeting a specific nerve but you're just going to go and hit the bone and deposit local anesthetic to lift off the soft tissue about the bone lastly we'll come to local anesthetic infiltration now local anesthetic infiltration is something again which has been around for many years we've done it for more than a decade popularized by a group of australian surgeons but i've worked with so many different orthopedic surgeons and in some hands it works extremely well and patients are having very good analgesia. here however uh, that's uh, quite the exception and not the rule a lot of orthopedic surgeons are in a hurry and you often see infiltration being done like this Hundred mils of cocktail and a sharp needle. The knee is open and he's going to approach the posterior capsule and put the needle through blindly into the space behind it. Now, what's behind that posterior capsule? Yep. Uh huh. Hundred mils of cocktail. So. I'm not saying local anesthetic infiltration is bad or that it doesn't give good results. If, if, if you look at what we just saw about the genicular nerve blocks, the surgeon can easily put local anesthetic in the same place under vision, or we could do it with ultrasound. Uh, and it is it, it so, comes down to being good teamwork. What your surgeon agrees, some surgeons, the surgeons that I've worked with so far have not been that comfortable with me putting needles that close to the joint. They're happy for me to do adductor canal blocks. Uh, I pack, yes, uh, but close to the knee, I'm yet to convince them. Uh, I've not been able to convince them to put catheters in. So, and, and there are so many different combinations, so many different options which we can choose. Nevertheless, to sum it up, there are a lot of different options which are available to us in terms of regional anesthesia. What we want to achieve is good pain relief for all patients. We may or may not be able to do day surgery for all patients. We have to be very careful in choosing whom we can mobilize on the same day and whom we can send home within 24 hours. But if he, whether or not they go home within the same day, we would want to give good analgesia and ideally not give motor paralysis and ideally give them a situation where they can be mobilized as quickly as possible. And, and these are all the different options which we can do. So. These are this is the, what I wanted to do was try to put it into the context of the complexity of knee surgery and what options we have. So apologies uh, for the technical problems. I don't know how well the videos came up. And with that, I complete my talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for the excellent presentation. Sir, <laughs> plus. Uh, uh, Master, sir, we shall continue with the next presentation and later take the questions or uh, yes, the questions. You, are, you will be online? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'll be here. You are free, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be here. Okay. So then uh, oh. we can go to Manjur. Okay. So the next <clears throat> uh, presenter will be Dr. Manjula Devi. And uh, mm -hmm. she is a professor of anesthesia as mm -hmm. well as uh, associate uh, Medical student uh, OT services, OT and surgical services, St. John's Medical College, Bangalore. Uh, she has special interests for regional anesthesia, difficult airway, ortho and trauma anesthesia, and uh, teaching the uh, life resuscitation skills. And she is a regular speaker at the state, zonal, and national levels. And uh, currently, she is conducting the national difficult airway uh, this year in September at Bangalore, and she is the organizing secretary for the national conference. Uh, over to Dr. Manjula, and she'll be talking on perioperative analgesia for hip surgery. Dr. Manjula, please. Thank you, Kiran, for that kind introduction. Are you able to see my screen? Yeah, yeah. I think you need to put the slideshow. I have put it on slideshow. Yeah. Has it come? No, not yet.
and just reopen it. See now. You need to click on the slideshow button, madam. So there is, there is uh, an additional item which is seen. Uh, you can click on that and close that. Slides and outline. That sidebar is seen in the view. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yes. Now, now, yeah, yeah. now you please again click on the slideshow once again. I clicked the slideshow. Okay. Now, in the sense, it's happening just like what it happened in the beginning. Okay. Uh, when we started at around uh, seven. Okay, on the left side you close just like uh, that. On the left bottom there is a display. Close, yeah, please. Yeah. It's almost done. Once again, we click on slideshow. Clicked on slideshow, not seen. Yeah. But we are seeing some. Uh, uh, again, word word thing is seen. Word file is seen in the background. This one's more. Any better, sir? Hello? Uh, Not at all. Mm. You are able to see the full screen on your... Uh... Yes, I'm able to see the full screen. Uh -huh. uh, now, okay. I put on the slideshow. No, what you do, uh, first click on the uh, that close uh, cross button of the word file. There's no files opened in my word file is there. Ah, that you click on. There's nothing opened in mine, sir. Actually, on okay. that. Okay, the, the, the close button is there. No, click on that cross sign. Yeah. No reopen. Mm -hmm. It had come in the beginning. Wherever the file is, you click on the right side and don't directly click open on the left side. Right, right click. Open with, open with, come down. Open with. Huh. Okay. Yes. My professor, do it, please. Now? It's just attempting, it's not opening it. What is it? Just do it again. Right click, like, just attempt right click. I click again. Is it attempting to open in the laptop? Yes, it's opening the laptop. I'm getting a full side. Uh, has it come now? It has come. Slideshow has come. Slideshow has come. Then uh, this window you uh, minimize the current window where you are trying to pick up the PPT and right click. That window you minimize. Yeah, close it. Uh, but your sharing is gone now. Share again. Mm -hmm. No. Now, sir. One, one, one. Okay. 
So anyway, click on the top where there is a maximize button. Middle just, one. Just before the cross button of floor. Middle, middle one. Yeah, yeah. Click. Does it take? Does it? Does it take? Click on it. Uh, you are able to click on that. So oh, there is nothing uh, because mine is complete uh, window open. It is. Okay. Okay. So you can continue reads. No problem. Yeah. You can continue. You are able to see except that we are not able to see the full window. Make it is a slide show. In the real. Other slides are moving, sir. Are there other slides moving? Uh, you just press. Now. Will. Uh... Mm -hmm. okay, okay, again, go to that uh, folder and click on that PowerPoint. You have got an additional PowerPoint software that is creating conflict. So you go to the second one. Don't pick up the Microsoft PowerPoint. The second one we'll see. Can I try and share your slides? I've got the copy. So she has to transfer it to you, no? Yeah, she has sent it to me. She has sent? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Not be able to move them, no? Can I? I won't be able to move them. You won't be able to. You'll have to say next slide and I can click next. One final projection, you do the technique, no, Majula? Huh? Ah, now, my, that folder is open. Okay, now we are seeing your screen. Okay. Maximize Madi, what I'm doing. You can maximize Madi. Middle one. Okay. I oh, maximize. Oh. Ah, now, slideshow is set to be clicked. You click on the slideshow. Hmm. Ah. Okay, that's enough. It's come. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. okay. yeah. Yeah. Are the slides moving, sir? Yes, good. Okay. Yeah. Then, then please, please. Go sorry, ahead. I'm really sorry about this and uh, apologize for it. Um, yes, uh, I'm here. Uh, very thankful to our teachers uh, from Bellari Group. I, I saw Guruji Sir, Baskar Sir, from whom I learned a lot of blogs. And uh, it's one of the wonderful opportunity to share my little experience on this particular topic the perioperative analgesia for hip surgery. And uh, mine is a tertiary care hospital. We deal a lot of orthopedic and trauma. And of course, all of this does come on everyday OT list of ours. And uh, it, since we have equipment like ultrasound machine, it has re really made us advance to the techniques that are available all across the globe. So we've had an opportunity to do what we would like to do. And uh, of course, give a good pain relief on the patients. So when we say uh, perioperative analgesia over here, uh, you know, as usual, it is divided into preoperative, intraoperative, and the postoperative phase. I think when I went to Ganga Hospital, I was very fascinated to learn this what is called as an on-arrival blocks, which said that as soon as a patient with a trauma comes with, say, hip injury, say trauma, a fracture or a fracture off or anything like that, as soon as the patient comes, they were be they were able to give some pain relief by like uh, kind of putting a fascia locus. Uh, on as soon as they enter the emergency medicine. So that was where I was really fascinated to learn the terminology called as on arrival blocks. Intraoperative, we do use them. I'll go about it as my slides move on. And postoperative, unlike knee surgeries, which they just talked, uh, they're using catheters and other things. Very little less is known about the hip surgery, catheter, and the postoperative infusions per se. So as they just did say that, you know, the pain relief is really a complex, be it a knee or a hip surgery, it's really complex and the various reasons and it's multifactorial. So if you look into the hip injuries that happen, 
the mechanism of the hip injury can vary. The experiences and the pain of the patient can vary. Uh, uh, an elderly patient can just strip down and just fall off because she's got an osteoporotic bone and uh, she may sustain an intertrochantic fracture. Whereas a young girl who is having a sports injury might just kind of extend, overextend her hip and uh, sustain an injury. So that's coming to about the age. Then also why it is complex is because pain is not from one source. It has got multiple sources, which I'll be talking to you. And the hip joint per se is got multiple innovation as well. And different injuries and different surgeries also make us to tailor what we are supposed to do. So that's why this is a challenge of how to go ahead with the perioperative analgesia. As a dictum, any analgesia, when we say, we always say it as a multimodal. So it is always a systemic opioids, non-opioid based or a regional technique that we use. But what's important is when, when are we giving this analysis? Is it in a preoperative phase or a, or a postoperative phase? When I say preoperative phase, what is it important? So in a preoperative phase, I think the patient, when he comes with a trauma or an injury, the first thing is pain on movement. Is it because of the bony fracture? Or it could be because of the muscle trauma, the, the traction that has happened. The more, uh, the, the more a muscle mass in a young patient, the more pain he's going to experience. And like the less you see them in the elderly, because one is about the sensitivity, two is about less muscle mass. And the spasm that can happen, the so iliosos muscle spasm that can happen itself can create a lot of pain. So it's very important for us to take care of this pain relief during the preoperative period. And if I again quote a preoperative phase, it is just before giving the spinal or an epidural or a regional, where we use this preoperative facial occurs block just to position the patient so that we get an adequate positioning to conduct our neuraxial blocks. In post-operative period or the intraoperative period, I should to be precise, the pain can arise from just the surgical skin incision. It could be because of a lot of muscle dissection that happens as they get into the bone. And of course, some of the surgeries does involve a lot of bone instrumentation. So the loss of drilling and kind of things that happen, that means that all this pain has to be taken care of. And uh, as they just said, early mobilization has been the go these days. And it also depends on what kind of blocks are we using? Do we want a patient to be too prolonged or do we want him an early ambulation? It's also a decision factor to be taken. When I say multiple sources of pain, this is an interesting article which shows about the, the density of the neural structures that's present in each of the soft tissue of the hip joint. And if you see over here, the skin, the subdermal and the uh, superficial fascia per se itself has got a lot of density of neural structures. The next I see over here is a ligament capsule of the ligament. And all of these structures, beta, skin, subdermal tissue, superficial adipose tissue, deep adipose tissue, deep fascia, muscle, pain even from the muscle, tendon, ligament, capsule, all of this do contribute for the pain. And each of the pain have got the mechanoreceptors as well as the nose receptors that can transmit and again, it goes on to the sensitivity of the patient, how much is going to digest that pain or how much is going to be, how much do we need to give to take care of that pain as well. So when we see this, that's why I think the anatomy, when we look and go back, uh, there's a lot of nerves that are involved in supplying, just not the cutaneous, but also the muscle supply is different. So the cutaneous secondary distribution is very different and the muscular distribution is also different. And so, so also goes with the osseous distribution. And, uh, and the uh, capsula, that is the articular branches as well. So we will go through about how all this pain uh, modalities will be responsible when we are looking into the cutaneous, muscular, or the osseous, or the articular branches that are involved. Uh, this is a very simple uh, anatomical picture which all of us have learned before. But what I would like to get your attention to is, if you look into this picture, you see that there are a lot of uh, landmarks that are very important, especially when you're performing an ultrasound uh, blocks. So there are the landmarks like bone, there are landmarks like muscles, there are landmarks like uh, vessels, which are relevant when we are looking at the nerves and the course of the nerves. So the major hip joint is supplied basically from the lumbar as well as the sacral plexus per se. The joint capsule, if you see, there's an anterior portion of the joint capsule and a posterior portion of the joint capsule. And the main uh, nerves that are supplying the anterior portion is the femoral branch, femoral nerve. And the anteromedial portion is supplied by the obturator nerve. The posterior portion of the capsule is supplied by the sciatic nerve. Now we look into the different surgeries. So in my hospital, we are still not too uh, well aware about the hip arthroscopic surgeries, but I am aware that the hip arthroscopic surgeries does involve a lot of irrigation fluid being pushed in 
to look into the joint and the capsular distension itself can create a pain. Apart from that, the positioning and the traction of the limb that is being utilized for this particular procedure also can create another um, you know, aspect of pain. Then coming to the hip screws, you know, the arthroplasties, which they just also was talking about the knee arthroplasties and all. Like that we have hip arthroplasties also. There's a lot of drilling and all that goes via the intracapsular ligament and all those things that itself can generate pain. And a lot of muscle dissection does happen during that. When it comes to bone instrumentation, no doubt the dynamic hip screws or the intramedullary nail itself can produce much more pain than what a small hip arthroscopy would do. So if you look into the cutaneous innervation over here, depending on, this is just an example to show that uh, though we have a total hip replacement being performed at various sites, a surgical incision, it does matter where the surgical incision is, whether it's a posterior approach, is it a lateral approach, or is it an anterior approach? Based on that, we also have the cutaneous distribution of the nerves. For example, if the posterior portion of the total hip replacement, the extended incision is somewhere behind over here, that means I have to involve the subcostal nerve. It's just not the, uh, just not the lateral cutaneous that is involved in the sensory distribution. So such kind of things also plays a role when I say different surgeries and different scenarios, apart from the patient factors that I talked about. So this is in a summary of what all the nerves that are involved uh, that supply the skin, muscles, ligaments, joint capsules, and bone. Important over here is, of course, the as I said, it's a part of lumbar and a sacral plexus. And we have the subcostal iliohypogastric superior cranial nerves, which are dorsal one of the L1, 2, 3, and uh, lateral femoral cutaneous doing the major supplies of cutaneous innervation. Whereas the muscles and ligaments are supplied by the superior and inferior gluteal nerves, femoral nerve, obturator nerve, and the sciatic nerve. The majority of the joint capsule and the bone per se is supplied by femoral obturator as well as sciatic nerve. And we're looking at regional analysis options for hip analgesia, coming from center to periphery. Um, if you look into things, you know, the victim, whether GA or a neuraxial, again, is left as a controversial. Both are accepted and are considered as level one evidence. And uh, neuraxial blocks nowadays have become a little more vogue because of the ambulatory surgeries per se. And uh, uh, the general analysis are combined with some superficial blocks are become an added factor. <laughs> the spinal, the epidural, the lumbar plexus block, the block, static nerve block are some of the central nerve blocks. Whereas the supra inguinal fascia allocus block, fascia allocus block, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve block, femoral nerve block, obturator nerve block, and the peng block, which is nothing but pericapsular nerve group block, are some of the regional analysis options available for hip analgesia. The prospect is a guideline that came up, which looks as a blog in looking at the procedure-specific post-operative pain management. And the last was in 2010. And after 10 years, we have had another one in 2021. Not much has changed in the sense that they still go with those multimodal analgesic regimes where paracetamol, non-steroidal, dexamethasone are still a part of the pain management. And still continuing is also about spinal anesthesia or an intrathecal morphine, with just 100 mics added into the spinal. And uh, lesser is known about the single short fascia like a block or local infiltration analgesia. These guidelines do say they are great D, I mean, it's lower evidence. I guess what much of it has happened in the last one or two years. So there might be a revision of this very soon, where the peripheral, you know, the facial plane blocks may get added here as part of the pre-operative and interoperative management as well. So coming to the proper nerve, I'm not going to go much in details because we're all aware about it. The hip joint is supplied by the nerve to rectus femoris, which is a posterior division of the femoral nerve. And all of us have learned before how we give a femoral nerve block. So as they just said, in a knee, we are going lower down, whereas in, in a hip, we are almost going at upper part of the femoral triangle. So over here, if you see, we have this vessels. I was thinking about the landmarks. So we have a vessels here, femoral artery and vein. We have the fascia lata, fascia ilaca, and just above the iliopsoas muscle, another landmark, and below the fascia ilaca, we'll have this femoral nerve. And that's where we inject coming from in-plane or out-of-plane approach and depositing the drug so that the nerve bathes in the drug. The obturator nerve, uh, again, both femur and obturator nerve, they go over the psoas muscle. They're a part of the lumbar plexus. And uh, the obturator nerve is more uh, sitting on the middle portion of the psoas muscle. And uh, the anterior division, again, obturator nerve has got two divisions, anterior and posterior division. Is the anterior division that gets involved in the hip joint supply. The posterior division more so goes for the knee joint. So if you look into this ultrasound guided of 
operator now you can go with a proximal approach and a distal approach a proximal approach where the the articular branch from the obturator now comes just before the muzzle pierces the obturator externus is something which we need to aim at so if you come lower down there are chances that we might have not been covering the particular part of the obturator nerve uh, involvement of the hip joint so the proximal approach of an obturator nerve the anterior division of it is something which we can uh, look at when you're looking at the analgesia for the hip joint and also in 30% of the population, there's something called as accessory operator nerve, again being a branches of the lumbar plexus, the ventral rame of it. And in this uh, accessory operator nerve, 30% of the population do have the nerve supply of their hip joint by this accessory operator nerve. It does give a branch into the hip joint and also has a communicating branch to the anterior division of the operator nerve and thus plays a role in the analgesic bit as well. Static nerve block, the more proximal approaches, uh, something like a subgluteal approach or uh, something like a parasacral approach, the psoas block and all which was used before are also being used now, but uh, these are some things which we are looking at giving a sciatic nerve block much more in the proximal side. So very simple with an ultrasound guidance is some landmarks between two uh, bony landmarks such as femur or ischium and just below the gluteus maximus muscle and just above the quadratus femoris muscle you can see this sciatic nerve. So you just place a probe on this particular point and you'll be able to see this uh, nerve thick and uh, very visible. So that's something which we look at blocking the nerve. Another thing this I really like about this particular parasacral approach, very simple again, ultrasound uh, probe, linear probe, just eight centimeter from the upper part of the gluteate left, just place the probe there. So you almost reach towards the alloy of the ilium and slide it down slowly, more corded. As you slide down, First, you see the alloy of ileum like this. As you slide down, you suddenly see a notch, which is nothing but greater sciatic foramen. And if once you see the notch, you just move this probe a little more cordially, and you see this little gap. You know, this breakage, the continuity of the line that you see in the alloy of the ileum is broken down to a notch, and then you suddenly see the nerve erupting. So that's where the sciatic nerve just coming out from the greater sciatic foramen. So this is a parasacral approach, I think is very useful. But less of sciatic nerve is performed uh, in a hip joint per se, because uh, if you look into the anatomy bit of it, the capsular, the anterior capsule has got much more of mechanoreceptors and the nauseous receptors than the posterior. And that's why I think the peng block has become more of an advanced one rather than going on to the static of parasacral approach these days. Some of the facial plane blocks which have really emerged in the last, say, I would say five, six years, uh, which I would like to mention is uh, one is quadratus lumborum block. So if you look into the literature, there have been a few case reports and uh, less of studies as such by the quadratus lumborum. But uh, I did come across a meta-analysis which just showed that the post-op uh, pain scores did reduce and the, uh, the opioid usage not only was sparing, but almost nearing to you know, less than 30 to 40% of a normal usage without the block. So quadratus lumborum block, again, if you look, uh, not going into details of it, transmuscular approach, that is, the, that is the anterior approach towards the quadratus lumborum where the space, the, uh, the, the little fascia between the psoas muscle and the quadratus lumborum is the space that we target. And when we see that uh, and we deposit around 30 to 40 ml of the local anesthetic, it seeps down to the lumbar plexus and also the lumbar nerve roots. So this is something which has been off late. Uh, people do worry when you have you know, something like a fascia like a why you go into a deeper ones like quadratus lumborum, but definitely this is one of those alternative modalities if you want to give. Lumbar erector spinae block uh, is another thing. I think my slides have overlapped because I'm unable to do the slideshow here. Um, so if you look into the lumbar uh, erector spinae block, this is like any other erector spinae block, uh, going by the parasagittal, parasagittal approach, hitting on the transverse process, depositing the drug just below the erector spinae muscle, a good volume-based block, 30 to 40 mils, again, is going to cover into the same kind of what we look into quadratus lumborum. So basically, they say that the quadratus lumborum and lumbar erector spinae, apart from the anatomy, there's really not much of a difference because it looks like an extension of the sheets and it's just the same kind of spread. So this is one of those uh, articles which has shown an MRI imaging of uh, how the uh, drug would move when you're given the volume, a good volume. It has shown not only a spread onto the lumbar plexus uh, spread, but also to paravertebral spread, epidural spread, and interforaminal spread, showing us that yes, when you go at a L2, L3 level, you can hit onto the 
major nerves of the lumbar plexus that we are interested on the hip joint. Facial alaka compartment block, I think it started very late, I mean, early, something like in 1918 and when it was first published. And uh, then it was also called as a three in one block, uh, three in one because three nerves, they said that the lateral cutaneous nerve, the femoral nerve, and the obstetrical nerve do get covered. If you look into this anatomy over here, you see that just underneath the facial lata, you do have this nerves, but there's a lot of coverage of other things, which may not actually promise that all the three nerves are really taken care of with just uh, depositing a little bit of the drug on more of the lateral side of the fascia ilaka. So this, was, uh, this is a, region, a reason why I think they've now moved into different approaches, both called a supra-inguinal and a infra-inguinal approach. Uh, supra-inguinal approach in the last three, four years has really taken into much uh, much more, uh, you know, kind of uh, advantage uh, because uh, it has got, uh, because of the volume and above the inguinal ligament, when you deposit a good volume of the drug, it goes beyond the psoas muscle and some of the lumbar plexus can also be affected with this. It's also called as a sci-fi block, which means supra-inguinal fascia lacus block. So there are various approaches to do it. You can go at the supra-inguinal region itself, where you just uh, you know, just near the ilacus muscle, uh, uh, near to the anterior inferior iliac spine, uh, just above the ilacus muscle, place the needle and deposit the drug. This is one approach. Or you can also go what this uh, is commonly called as a bow tie sign, where there are two muscles, internoblique and sartorius, and just go at an out of plane approach and uh, deposit the drug just below this the fascia ilaca. So this is something which is uh, sci-fi block. This is what I was talking about, the bow tie sign, where internal oblique and the sartorius muscle and the inguinal ligament and just below the uh, fascia ilaca is what we are looking at the drug deposition. And uh, this is how the trajectory is, and this is how the local lensic spread, spread can be seen as well. The infrainguinal approach is still being used, and uh, one of the advantages, of course, uh, we have the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve and the femoral nerve, and maybe an obstetrical nerve still being blocked, but it's definitely not that it's 100% going to be blocked. But what happens with the infrainguinal fa facial lacquer block is if the femoral nerve gets blocked, and uh, these days we're looking at motor sparing blocks. And if the femoral nerve gets blocked, that means the patient is going to have quadriceps uh, weakness and uh, will be unable to ambulate. So this is the reason why we are now preferring a supraingual rather than an infrainguinal approach. So this is again, uh, one of the MRI report which has shown that the supraingual is much better the uh, infrainguinal uh, because of its more consistency on how it is being spread. And uh, definitely the sensory block of the medial anterior and lateral region of the thigh are involved when you give a good volume. And uh, easily the three targeted nerves of the lumbar plexus are also inconsistent in the supraingual approach. Ring block is something uh, which came up uh, you know, in 2018. And this is more like a periarticular block. And as I said before, femoral nerve, the obturator nerve, and the accessory obturator nerve the articular branches of these three nerves plays an important role, especially between these bony prominences. So between the anterior inferior iliac spine, as well as the ischial pubic eminence, this is where you expect the articular branches of these three nerves that branch out. So depending on the volume of the drug, you can see an extensive spread of it and how nicely it gets covered. Important over here is that when you're looking into the landmarks and you're just gone between the anterior inferior iliac spine, and ischial pubic eminence, and you see the psoas tendon and you deposit the drug beneath it. Uh, if you're going too much on a volume, not only that you see the muscle being lifted, but that can also be spread to the femoral uh, nerve again. So that becomes a disadvantage, which we don't want, where we said that quadriceps involvement to the femoral nerve is not very really good in an ambulatory surgery. They have been looking at um, how to put in catheters when you have performed a pain block, and this, some articles have shown up now. It has uh, shown quite good. Uh, I think it, if, if you're having a surgical incision somewhere there, I don't think any of the surgeons are going to allow you for the catheter. But of course, using dexamethasone on a joint with the local anesthetic will be able to, you'll be able to stretch out the analgesic period for, uh, say, 10 to 12 hours easily. And there have been looking at, you know, combination of blocks. So just before positioning, you do a facial lacus block. Uh, do away with the spinal, and after the spinal, after the case is over, give a pain block for the post appendage. So, so these are some of the like permutations, combinations also that they've been doing. There are also articles where they've used pain block along with local infiltration uh, analgesia by the surgeons. So they found that you know this also is very helpful. So there's really no concrete saying you do this block for this particular surgery 
per se. And uh, just again to conclude, there are a lot of you know this nerves blocks which we are doing, and what we have to look now is the trends that is the ambulatory surgery. We have to do a motor sp uh, sparing, and we have to go with the patient's needs as well. So I think in conclusion, the decision of whether I do a block, I do not do a block depends on various factors, and uh, of course. Uh, we have to take the medical uh, comorbidities as a consideration when it comes to a patient. And what are we expecting a desired outcome? Is it an ambulatory surgery or is the patient going to be admitted in the ward for two, three days? And the preferences nowadays is also in the decision making when we involve the patient as well. Clinical preference and the uh, skills by the particular proceduralist also becomes important. I might be very happy to do a pain block rather than doing a facial echoes block. So that becomes my preference again. Of course, institutional practices may alert, like if you look into NYSERA, NYSERA Compedigam, they have a, you know, Dr. Hatzik does mention that in this particular hospital, this is the institutional practice for all hip uh, NOFs, this is what they're going to practice. So that becomes an institutional practice. It also depends on what are the resources availability. I might not be having an ultrasound machine. I might be just having uh, to do, I might be in a remote location where I might have to do only the blind blocks or I might having I might be having just a personal nerve stimulator where I have to just still do with the nerve stimulation. So all that does matter, but what is very important is ultimately uh, having a, a very safe patient with us, not injuring major vessels, not posing problems, infections, and those kind of things, post-operative adverse effects, and uh, having a good team, as they just said, that it's very important that you have a good rapport with the surgeon and the patient and uh, be able to decide on what block you want to give. And I, I'm a personally, I think I'm in favor of uh, giving blocks. And even though I give a spinal to my patient, I still give a pen block and, uh, you know, make sure that the post-op panagisa is also taken care. So thank you, sir. That's it from my side. Thank you, Dr. Manjula, for an excellent presentation. And uh, we have some questions from the chat box, I think. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, please um, go ahead. And, uh, Tejas has answered some questions already in the chat box. I think Tejas has uh, answered uh, many uh, of his questions so that were put to him. And uh, Dr. Harish has been asking, the ideal volume for peng block. Like okay. Yeah, the ideal, there's no ideal. So they've looked into articles of uh, where the range has been between 20 to 40 mils. So they've said the higher volume, then we expect a good approach uh, more towards, uh, you know, supra, uh, uh, more volume being covered so that it may extend to the uh, lumbar plexus, more so seeping onto the source muscle. So higher volume is... Uh, more of the lumbar plexus involvement. Lower volume, maybe just look into the articular uh, branches between the two bony prominences, that is the anti inferior LX spine and the ischial pubic eminence. And uh, we have one question from Dr. Prashant. Yeah. Are you sure all three nerves are blocked in tight height? There is a supra invinal approach for tight height. No, actually, the sci fi doesn't block. Uh, when I say all the three nerves, I mean the lumbar plexus. So here I'm looking at, uh, again, it's a volume-based block. And uh, the more volume we give, we expect that it seeps higher up. That's why one of the, uh, one of the tip when you're doing a supra-inguinal approach is, you know, you basically place the needle from caudal to cranial direction so that you make sure it goes in the supra-inguinal and not seeping below the inguinal ligament uh, infra. So when you do that, uh, the three nerves I'm still looking at is, you know, obturator and femoral and probably an accessory obturator if they're part of the lumbar plexus that is coming down. So I'm looking at the volume going supra-inguinal acting towards the psoas where the medial bit of the psoas, you can see an obturator, the lateral bit, you may see the uh, femoral component of the nerve. Okay. And uh, Dr. Balakrishna, his question is, which is better for hemiarthroplasty, sci-fi or pang block? Uh, I think, I mean, if to give a personal experience, I would still say pang, pang block, but uh, articles are yet awaited. That's why, you know, a lot of randomized control trials are being looked at. And uh, again, so when you're looking at pang versus uh, sci-fi block, both of them are kind of motor sparing. And uh, in, in, uh, in a pang block, there is a little disadvantage if you go much on the volume, then it may affect the femoral component. So then you might have a cordyceps. So if you look 
pain relief wise both are almost equal but one of the minus with the pain compared to supra inguinal being that a femoral component can be involved if you are giving a big volume okay uh, so, i have one in my experience sorry <laughs> sorry i am yeah, cutting yeah. in between yeah, yes yes go please ahead, See, the uh, concept is small nerves are easily blocked. So when you are talking about peng block or geniculate block, you are talking about tiny articular branches. A little bit of local anesthetic in the right plane will, will easily block them. Conver on the converse of it is that it wears off easily because the nerve is small; it won't hold the local anesthetic too long. It will diffuse yeah. out, and particularly in vascular planes. So the peng block is a short-acting block. It will give you two to four hours of analgesia. You put it in pre-op; it's good for your positioning for the spinal and the broken hip. Uh, unlikely to be working six hours down the line, uh, whereas a nerve block is more likely to be working six to twelve hours. Uh, sciatic nerve block twenty-four hours, biggest nerve for that. So, you should plan for a continuous block. Continuous it depends block. on what you are trying to achieve. It is a, that is why it is multimodal. And when do you put in the block? And what is what are you trying to achieve? If you, if you are looking at positioning the patient for a good spinal, and you put in a pen block, it will work beautifully well. Uh, but if you are looking at six hours or ten hours down the line, a pen block perhaps won't work unless you have a catheter. If uh, uh, if ask. Which is a single nerve block that covers the entire knee joint. Single nerve block. If you want to give knee joint cannot be covered by entire knee joint. That's a fairly say, easiest answer. So if if I have to choose only one nerve block to get the best analgesia, I would do adductor canal, which will give most of the anterior medial part. And if you look at where the surgeons go in, they go in through the anterior medial aspect. That's where the capsule is cut open, uh, and that is where the pain is the se most severe. What about you, Madam Manjula, Madam? Single nerve block for the hip joint. For hip joint, uh, again, I mean the answer is still the same, except that uh, uh, I mean there's it's always a multimodal analysis, yeah. And uh, if I have to look, I think I'll still like the pain block. Pain block. Okay. So, good day, sir. Your comments, sir. Uh, excellent day, sir. Uh, uh, lectures. Uh, you know. No need to comment anything about uh, the uh, both the talks. Uh, actually, both the Tejas and Manjula spoke very well. So, so one uh, question to Tejas because you know Tejas, you were talking about all these nerve blocks, but uh, whenever we talk about analgesia, we always talk about the multimodal analgesia. Yeah. And what other um, modes of analgesia you would recommend for uh, uh, knee surgeries right. other than the nerve blocks? I am talking about. See, well, well, yeah, it has to be multimodal simply because of what I just said. The, our nerve blocks can be expected to wear off in a matter of hours, maybe six, maybe 12, but they will wear off. And the pain is going to be there severe for two to three days potentially. Uh, and then slowly comes down. So you need analgesia. Um, so all the non-pharmacological methods in terms of preparing them mentally and physically for surgery are important. Many of these patients are arthritic patients. They are already on a significant amount of analgesia. Those who have been on long-term opioid analgesia pre-op are likely to need long-term analg opioid analgesia post-op. You, so you will have to continue whatever level of analgesics they're on, plus a bit more to cover the acute pain of the acute operation. Um, so as a standard, what we do, we, we give all of them one dose of dexamethasone as an adjuvant. Uh, we give it IV or oral. Uh, we, all of them get paracetamol. Uh, who, wherever possible, we give non-steroidals. And on top of this, uh, you can use this, your opioid of choice, your, either oxycodone or morphine. In, in, our, in our hospital, it's morphine is the opioid of choice. Uh, but if somebody is already on oxycodone, I would rather continue on what they are on. So if somebody is on fentanyl patch, then we continue with that plus a bit of other opioid or something like that. So you need all of these things plus the nerve blocks where appropriate. So you still use uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for these patients because geriatric patients where no possible. On, uh, so that is the caveat. Uh, and, yeah, uh, most of the times it is not possible. No, because I you know majority of the times what I have seen is uh, these paracetamol itself is the most commonly used uh, yeah. post-op analgesic as a part of multimodal analgesic. Yeah. So that is still being used, I think. Along yeah, with paracetamol will up. always be there. That is the first step. So everybody gets paracetamol. Very few people may get non-steroidals. Only where it is where they are a little bit young, no renal problems, maybe we can. But 
more more often than not we don't use non steroidals a uh, single dose of dexamethasone we use for a time for a period of time we used uh, pregabalin or gabapentin um, and now that seems to have gone out of favor it's it seems to add a bit more to their imbalance and sedation but not so much to their analgesia so we have stopped using it now okay how about um, uh, continuous adducted canal block you are talking about single shot because single shot maximum is 24 hours Yeah. but why can't we keep a catheter and then continue for very much days? can be used there are yeah. people there are centers which we use it if we use a continuous now catheter block one we need surgeons on board who are willing to accept that in in my hospital that has not yet happened two uh, if you're going to put in a catheter you need to decide how long you are going to keep it in for how you are going to infuse in it is it an elastomeric pump or is somebody is somebody going to go around and give bolus top ups uh, who is going to remove the catheter when is it going to be removed so all of these uh, the, the systems have to be in place to look after the catheters once we get all that right there is no reason why we can't i mean uh, is, there are some regional anesthetists who would say if you're going to put a block at all you should put a catheter yeah that uh, is what's the point in sure. just giving few hours yeah and uh, why i don't know why the surgeons are uh, reluctant to go for a continuous blocks and you know as long as it is going to be benefited to. to the patient because you know what uh, finally what we want is uh, you know everything should be going to the benefit benefits to the patient isn't it so finally it should be the outcome should be that so when yeah. it can so i think there should not be because you know anyway it's not going to produce any motor blockade and your analgesia yeah. so i think that should be uh, the surgeons things. will have two main concerns one you will take too much time pre op or two they are worried about infection um so if we can convince them about both these things and I, I, neither of these should be a stopping problem we should be able to do catheters now another thing is uh, how about um, adding um, morphine as an adjuvant to these blocks will it help patchy evidence morphine as an adjuvant whether morphine works in the peripheral area or is it as the same as giving the similar amount of morphine i am uh, we don't really know uh, oh. and we and it is it's difficult to prove it either way so if uh, people have used it and plus or minus and uh, what we want is uh, elderly patients uh, the lesser the morphine we can use the better Uh, in terms of uh, avoiding constipation nausea confusion particularly confusion especially with broken hips but that's too urgent i mean you have to give strong analgesia and morphine is our go to drug so you can't say no but and no, they, they, even in the prospect guidelines they do mention like the spinal route they use 100 mics of morphine yeah, spinal intrathecal that's one of the gold standard for uh, post op analgesia yeah. So the 100 miles they say the amount of side effects that you see in morphine like you know nausea or pruritus or something like below very very minimal yeah and especially in asian population 100 miles is more than sufficient more only. Yeah. of course it may not be sufficient in uh, western uh, population it may be too less hips they go hips, up yes. to probably 300 400 micrograms yeah. but up to 1 mg sometimes they do go that's uh, you know they you know pharmacogenetic uh, difference between our uh, population and their population uh, and that are, and that also in 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 terms of individual patients people who are already on strong opioids for yeah, pain that is yes they need yeah. more um, otherwise 400 seems to be a bit of a ceiling you don't usually need more and knee pain is more difficult compared to hip okay thank you so much thank you manjula it was an excellent thank talk you, because thank you know you. i still uh, um, recently my um, uh, son's father in law underwent a hip surgery so no analgesia wo except intrathecal fentanyl was given we know that fentanyl acts for only few hours and it will not produce prolonged analgesia but uh, he was given only paracetamol in the post operative period and uh, geriatric patients with lot of frailty that is there you know very difficult to manage the pain as such as you said that you know there also i think you can use uh, continuous uh, uh, you know nerve blocks so that will definitely help in early mobilization of these patients especially after hip surgeries so do you practice continuous uh, blocks now blocks there no sir we don't again, have again the same infusion and the same yeah, surgeons yeah they just was talking about again the problem with the surgeons infection surgeons. and all so i don't think uh, infection should be a, much of a problem as long as you are using aseptic precautions For but in elderly what i can add a point is sir, they have the pain itself is multifactorial 
and the elderly will not be able to say it's because of pain they get restless and you have a post operative cognitive dysfunction pain. and those things are always there so many times i feel that just when the you know when the patient's getting shifted out of the theater just give like a facial lock or a pain block and asking of course a surgeon and you can see a good pain relief when you go for the post op rounds so that can be taken care of, as minimal that we can do for them yeah only thing is uh, if you are planning for day care surgeries you cannot go for continuous uh, blocks so then only oral or even patches like fentanyl patch buprenorphine patch all those things that can be added anyway thank you uh, both manjula and tejas excellent talks thank you thank you sir thank you so much thank you thank you sir basta uh, uh, sir yeah thanks a lot tejas uh, uh, manjula uh, the topic was too, quite good and uh, I think 65 participants were there uh, in the Zoom. I don't know how many were there in uh, uh, YouTube. So thanks a lot and uh, well illustrated and the discussions were also perfect. Thank you very much. And maybe we'll still have some participation in future when both of you are free. Yes, sir. All the best for the National Airway Conference also. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I have one question from the chat box. Will application of uh tourniquet will prolong the adductor canal block this is the question mm tourniquet is it tourniquet is a tricky one it it won't necessarily prolong adductor canal block but what we have seen and this is uh, across many different people that i have spoken to now that we are moving to more distal blocks geniculate blocks lower adductor canal block we are dealing with the knee pain very well but they complain of tourniquet pain post op especially if okay. the tonic if the surgeon is slow and takes more than an hour um, okay okay so that is, is it can be a problem in a different way yeah of so. course yeah that's true yes. uh, i think we have discussed enough i think so it was a very fruitful discussion and there were a lot many questions and very good inputs from master sir as well as your sir So, if there are no more questions, I think uh, we will conclude the session. Sir, okay. Yes, and meanwhile, anybody has got any doubt? Uh, Manjula and Tejas are ready to answer also. In fact, yeah. Dr. Manjula is ready to share the slides, but it is not required because it is available on YouTube. I will put the link in different groups for people to watch later also. So, thank you very much. Thanks, Sir Guru Sir. Thanks, uh, Dr. Govind Rao, and all the seniors. We had participation from uh, different parts. including mumbai and uh, vaisak and many of our senior colleagues were there uh, thanks to all the participants and for active <clears throat> exchange of uh, the academic questions so let us close yeah. good thank, you very much, thank you very much sir thank you thank you to you and thank you to dr manjula ma'am thank you thank you for the presentation and uh, especially thank to thanks dr tejas for accepting the invitation